Welcome back to the Buddy Ruski Show. My guest today is Mark Overbay from Big Spoon Roasters. Mark, thanks for being on the show. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. I, uh, I was tempted to do this entire podcast with peanut butter in my mouth to see how it would come out almost like uh, Mr. Ed, but <laughs> I thought maybe the, uh, the audience uh, probably wouldn't enjoy the experience as much as I would think it's funny. So I passed on that idea. That's that's probably the right call. It's it's funny for about ten seconds, and then yeah, it just gets in the way. It's a good uh, like TikTok clip. It's probably not good for an entire entire podcast. Uh, but uh, thank you again for being on the show. I'm really excited to chat with you today. Um, Big Spoon Roasters. I'm I'm seeing it everywhere now. I feel like uh, when when I started as a young entrepreneur in downtown Durham with Gabe at Runaway, um, this would have been. 2013, uh, you know, I would, I was aware of Big Spoon Roasters, um, but I, it wasn't as seemingly omnipresent as, as it is now, which is, you know, kudos to you. Um, so I'm excited to, to talk to you more uh, about the business and how it's grown. But uh, before uh, the podcast, we, we got to know each other a little bit and uh, you have a, a really uh, interesting sort of backstory getting to uh, being a a peanut butter entrepreneur, uh, a former aspiring journalist like myself, um, working in the, the Peace Corps as well. Um, there's, yes, a, a lot of twists and turns in there. Um, so I'd love to start uh, where I start with, with everyone on the show, sort of at the beginning, and hear a little bit more about your upbringing and, and maybe what shaped you into taking this path of entrepreneurship and, uh, and starting Big Spoon Roasters. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the the path to starting Big Spoon Roasters is definitely not one I ever could have predicted. Um, I uh, grew up an only child in, in northeast Tennessee, a town called Kingsport. And uh, my dad, um, who is still around, have a great relationship with both my parents, thankfully. Um, he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes when I was um, pretty young, like uh, early middle school. And back then, this was the late 80s, I mean, there was decent diabetes care, but not nearly what there is now. And there just wasn't a lot of um, uh, prevention. It was more just like, let's treat the symptoms. And um, it, it's, a, it's a devastating disease in many ways, as, as I'm sure so many people listening to this know. Um, but uh, I just remember looking up in an encyclopedia when I was in, you know, like sixth grade, uh, diabetes, the difference between type 1 and type 2, and then type 2 was what my dad had, and type 2 is affected by, you know, some genetics and also lifestyle choices, like what you eat, how much you exercise, and that really hit me, like, oh, wow, like, actually, the person with the, the disease maybe can control it a little bit with some lifestyle choices, and I remember thinking then, you know, maybe it would be cool to learn more about nutrition and uh, so that really started me down a path of being just interested in nutrition and how um, our relationship with food is beyond, you know, just pleasure. Also, it af directly affects our health. And so I kind of became like an amateur, you know, nutritionist in our, in, in our house, probably sometimes in an annoying way, uh, if you ask my parents. But I think they appreciated where it was coming from. You know, I'd always be coming to my dad like, oh, you know, hey, I just read, you know, if you if you eat, you know, nuts, when you eat a banana, it slows down, you know, how your body breaks it into or turns it into blood sugar. And, and you'd be like, whatever, you know, like, go go back to go back to shooting hoops or go back to school. Um, but it, it, it did really um, become really interesting to me. And uh, it's not like I ate perfectly or anything. It just, you know, was was a hobby. Um, and then uh, when I was in college at uh, Davidson, outside of Charlotte, small liberal arts school, um, I got a little bit into cooking um, just because, you know, you're on your own in dorms and then in an apartment. Um, and some friends of mine and I started a, a cooking club where we just rotate like, OK, I'm responsible for the entree. You're responsible for a side and she's responsible for another side. and Somebody else is responsible for drinks. And. That was really fun, and that was the first time that I made the connection between, like, the effort that you could put into cooking and the result. 
you know, I, I think before that I had just sort of thought, okay, some people are naturally good at cooking and they have a talent for it and that's great for them. I'm not one of those people. Um, I, I appreciated good cooking and like a lot of people in my family gardened. And so I had some awareness of, you know, where foods came from, but beyond that, I never saw myself as a cook, but in this cooking club, kind of accidentally realized that, oh, if I like actually tried a little bit harder, paid a little bit more attention, um, you know, I'm better at cooking than I thought. Um, so that was cool. It's and funny that you say, uh, you, you mentioned that you were the nutritional pest <laughs> in your, in your household. Cause I usually think of it as being flipped where the parents are the ones force feeding their kids saying, Hey, it's you know really important that you eat your fruits and vegetables. You can't eat candy all day. You can't eat, you know, sugary sweets all day. Uh, my dad uh, is, is vegan now and also works in, in food. And he was that person in, in our life where I remember distinctly Brussels sprouts being the thing that he was obsessed with and could never get my sister and I to eat them when we were younger. But now I probably eat them, you know, three times a week. Uh, and so there's a, you know, for young kids when their palate's developing, they're maybe not as in tune with all the different tastes and kind of how to manipulate them to make them taste the way they want to. Um, but it's interesting to hear you say that you were that person early on in, in your life uh, or in your, in your family that was driving that, uh, that narrative. Was there a particular thing that you uh, really tried to get your family to adopt in like your regular uh, meal rotation that did go over well, where maybe it wasn't a part of, you know, your, uh, the initial offering, but then your parents came around like, actually, oh, this is pretty good. Yeah. I would say, um, whole grains as opposed to refined, you know, like, uh, refined grains basically where all the, the fiber and the, the protein has been essentially refined out. Um, I, I remember reading that, you know, and my, my, hobbyist seventh grade or eighth grade self probably was reading an article in time magazine probably in the middle school library about um how you know whole grains are associated with lower risk of heart disease stroke uh, improved blood sugar control type 2 diabetes and i probably did something like you know as my dad was taking a bite of his you know blt on white bread i probably said dad you know maybe try that with whole grains. I promise it's better for you, which probably wasn't the right tactic because at the time he's like, are you kidding? You know, I'm trying to enjoy my sandwich. This already tastes great. What do I need to yeah, change? Exactly. But I, re I do remember, you know, they were totally game. And I mean, we mostly ate, ate like home cooked, m pretty healthy stuff, like plate full of vegetables and a protein and bread, you know, rice, you know, pretty standard American fare. Um, but we did like buy a lot of white, like white bread, white rice. And, um, I think eventually I wore them down to start, you know, buying more whole grain stuff. And, and, and we all actually liked it sometimes better than the refined grain version. So I like to think that paid off, but I don't know. Did anybody, uh, in your family growing up work in food? Not, not as a long-term profession. I mean, I think a lot of us uh, or a lot of people in my family, you know, like had jobs in food, you know, like in a restaurant, or, you know, as With a service server. workers, yeah, yeah. service, um, maybe in the kitchen. Um, but yeah, no, no one that I can think of made a career of it. I, I had a great uncle, um, one of my grandmother's sisters married, that was a phenomenal home cook, Uncle Joe. Uh, and uh, everyone in the family just like, you know, vied for, you know, a, a spot at his table or, you know, um, if they were having people over for dinner, it's like, oh, yeah, I hope he invites me because uh, he was such a phenomenal home cook. I always remember that. What did your parents do for a living? So um, also entrepreneurs. Um, my, my dad was in the Air Force right out of high school. He was like just too young probably to go to Vietnam mm. and uh, enlisted in the Air Force and uh, – after he got out of the Air Force, my parents got married. Um, they were high school sweethearts. Um, and, or actually, excuse me, they, he was still in the Air Force um, because I was born when he was in the Air Force. And I was born like on an Air Force base in Arkansas. 
But um, after that, uh, he had been an apprentice jeweler um, in, as, as, as a teenager, and he was just really interested in that, working with his hands, and um, I think he had a good mentor. Um, this is also in the town where I grew up. And uh, like making jewelry, repairing jewelry, gold, silver, um, setting stones, um, a little bit of design. And after the Air Force, he went back into that field and became a jeweler and uh, opened up a jewelry store um, near my hometown in East Tennessee and ran that store with my mom for years. Um, she opened a shoe store right next door when a lease became available. Um, and I remember it was when like uh, roos were popular, kangaroos. Oh, Before yeah. Before your time. This is the early 80s. Um, Walter Payton, the running back for the, for the Bears, uh, Hall of Fame running back, was like their biggest you know, he was a superstar. This was Super Bowl shuffle years. Jim yep. McMahon, Walter Payton, um, the fridge, and Payton wore a ruse. And so there, we had this big Walter Payton poster in there, and I thought it was so cool that my mom sold ruse. Had the little pocket on the side where you put your lunch money in the in the zipper pocket. Um, but unfortunately, the shoe store didn't do very well, um, and uh, I I don't know the details, but I. I they filed bankruptcy for it or what, but um, they rolled that up and focused on the jewelry store. And then um, my dad worked with a couple other partners over the years um, in, in the jewelry world. And we moved as a family to Kingsport, which was where I ended up growing up, going to high school. And, and he continued doing that. And my mom always worked in retail. And after she worked for our jewelry store, um, or our families, um, she went to JCPenney and was a jewelry department clerk and then uh, store store assistant manager I think when she when she retired a couple of years ago interesting yeah I would have never guessed that because you're not decked out and you know you don't have like big uh, you know chains or pearls dangling from your neck you, you know you don't yeah I guess you got a pretty nice watch on but that's uh, that's about it so I would have never guessed that uh, you were in the in the jewelry business uh, or your family was in the in the jewelry business but uh, you know, maybe, maybe you outgrew that phase. I'd love to see maybe some high school photos. Like if you went to prom and you just had, you know, the big old chains dangling. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's so funny. I haven't really thought about that, but yeah, no, I'm not a big jewelry person. Uh, I appreciate it though. And I love it. I love jewelry and other people, you know, uh, and yeah, it's, it's fun. My dad also like loves motorcycles, has ridden motorcycles his whole life and always had one. And I haven't had, never had any interest in riding a motorcycle. Um, I've ridden with him like on the back many times, you know, on many times for fun. Um, but yeah, it's like, that's his thing. Not, not so much my thing. And he, and my parents, like they wear very little jewelry mm. as well. Like just some, uh, but that's funny, but I definitely like, I rocked a little gold nugget ring when I was in like middle school for a while, I think. I had had a couple of gold chains with pendants, um, nothing too flashy, but I definitely I experimented a little bit. Did you think that you were interested in maybe not jewelry specifically as a um, profession or like apprenticing with your father, but being around them starting their own businesses? Uh, what was that experience like and what uh, now in hindsight can you remember maybe taking from their experience as you began to think about starting your own business? The, the work ethic that you have to have to be a successful entrepreneur, it, it's, it's impossible to overstate how important that is uh, because if it needs to be done, it's your responsibility that it gets done if you're the owner. Or, um, and I think I saw, you know, I, uh, every day after school, I'd walk to the jewelry store for years. And a lot of times I'd just do my homework in the back, but I'd finish it and there'd be more to the work day and I'd kind of hang out. And, you know, sometimes I'd help out with little things, but most of the time I didn't. I just like explored the shopping center or the mall or um, whatever. And just seeing my parents, you know, like go through every receipt and balance the books every day and um, clean and, you know, make sure the, um, the jewelry uh, showcases look good and pulling out every little piece of jewelry, every ring, every chain, every bracelet and polishing those and making sure they look perfect. Just seeing the, the commitment and attention to detail required 
to do retail well um, has always stuck with me. And I mean, I think at most they maybe employed one or two other people. So mm. it was mainly just them for years. And uh, I just saw and appreciated how, how hard they worked. And um, I think that's, that's always stuck with me more than anything else. Did you get a chance? You mentioned that uh, they were based in the shopping center and malls and things. Did you interact much with other entrepreneurs in that space? Were there other people that you also maybe looked up to or that mentor, mentored you at all um, during your upbringing? I definitely uh, like <laughs> had my run of, you know, a mall and a shopping center like where these stores were. Um, and I, and I, I interacted with a lot of the other shop owners and, and, and I think like front, front of house managers, if you will. Um, were there a lot of mom and pop places in, uh, I guess now I always think of malls and shopping centers as being a lot of the, you know, bigger retailers and in general, mom and pops have just been kind of gobbled up over the years. But, um, yeah, I'm wondering in your experience, were there more of those local establishments? It was a mix. There, there were in when when my dad had a shop in a mall it was definitely more like big chains like i knew the guys that worked at foot locker and i knew the you know the the people that worked in the uh, the the bookseller uh the b dalton bookseller and um things like that but uh in the, when it was in this smaller shopping center like strip mall basically um there was this little independent video store right next door which you know, a lot of people listening to this may not even know those existed or remember them, but this was like they had VHS and beta size, you know, video t tapes for, for VCRs. And that's how you watched movies at home, you know, unless you had HBO. But to get like the new releases, the cool stuff, you had to rent, you know, videos. This is pre Blockbuster even. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I remember that store was cool and talking to them and. Um, I was so young, though. I, I think, you know, I wasn't really thinking about uh, how a business was run or what it took to do it well. But it, but even then, I remember thinking about, you know, the same two women who own that store are in there every single day, open to close, doing inventory, talking to people, doing everything associated with that business. And that's, you know, that's what it takes. Yeah. I don't want to jump too far ahead because we'll get to some, some Durham stuff later on. But it hearing you say that makes me think of uh, Bond's cuisine on 9th Street because it's the same, I think it's a group of sisters that all run the restaurant and it's the same thing. Like when you go in there, the same two or three people are always working and for a long time, and I feel like they've brought on a couple other people over the years, but Cosmic Cantina uh, also the same way. It's these two guys I can think of uh, that are always behind the counter working there and it goes to your point about like taking ownership of the business and and making sure that like y you know you are steering the ship you are the captain of the ship and so uh if there's you know anything that has to be done you're kind of on the front lines there and even as you start to delegate responsibilities you still have an obligation to um, at least be willing to kind of get your hands dirty and and do the small things to to keep everything running so um, yeah, that is definitely, I can imagine seeing that. And even if you, like you said at the time, weren't thinking about going into business, that work ethic translates across, you know, any industry, anything you do in life, um, you can uh, take a lot of those skills and that attitude um, into whatever profession. So um, you mentioned uh, being at, at Davidson College what were you thinking about or what did you major in uh, while you were in school there? I double majored in English literature and philosophy. And uh, I had a concentration in film studies. Um, I, I really went into college with a lot of interest. I, I loved math. I loved physics. I loved chemistry. I loved literature. Um, I, I never had any academic philosophy before college, but um, having read like Dostoevsky uh, in high school and um, a little bit of Sartre and had a tiny exposure to how philosophical um, epistemology gets, you know, woven into literature, 
um, I really wanted more. I wanted more of that. And I wanted to understand the ideas behind some of these big words I was hearing and, you know, who, who are the thinkers that are, you know, articulating these um, incredibly, you know, complex questions and answers about, you know, the nature of being. And um, it, it just made a lot of sense at the time that these were important things to study, um, to, uh, to understand the world better, to understand the human experience better. So I went into college with sort of all those aspirations, intellectual aspirations, and not thinking about a career track necessarily. Um, b but I love storytelling, and I think that sparked my interest in, um, in writing and, and journalism, and I had always enjoyed writing um, in high school and college. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what college is, or I imagine its original intent was to, was not necessarily to you know, force everybody into these, you know, uh, tracks for careers, but to uh, open your mind and to enlighten you and to allow you to explore different ideas and ask complex questions and travel and gain exposure to other people and other cultures. Um, it's, yeah, obviously uh, more complicated now, I guess, with the cost of going to a university and with, um, trade schools becoming more um, in vogue and, you know, by necessity in a lot of ways. But um, it's, it is nice to hear someone reminisce about a time when college was really just for education and not this workforce development factory. Um, I went to Durham Tech for a few years and had a similar uh, epiphany or enlightenment uh, when I started reading, I took an American literature class there and um, we were actually reading Enlightenment era writers like Emerson and, um, and Thoreau and, uh, and that totally, it's partly why I also got interested in, in writing and, and storytelling and, um, and how words can affect people. And uh, so, yeah, it's, um, I feel like we are aligned in that way and I can distinctly remember that light bulb going off in my head, uh, reading that stuff. So, um, that's cool. Did you, uh, did you end up sticking with, uh, anything, uh, along the way, or were you kind of always a generalist going through college? I, uh, I, I did really, st I ended up sticking with, with English and philosophy most after, I guess my sophomore year and Davidson had this cool program. I th I'm pretty sure they still have it. It's just called the humanities track where um, it's your freshman and sophomore year and they bring in professors and lecturers from all, basically all the different um, liberal arts majors and you get lectures from them and um, it, it kind of weaves together the whole human experience throughout, you know, uh, written history and you, you start with, um, you know, some of the first recorded stories of known in any culture throughout the world and, and kind of get up to the modern age. And so that was cool. But uh, yeah, aside from formal logic, which I didn't really enjoy, but it was required for the philosophy major, um, I, I stuck with, with keep it, I tried to keep advancing my, my philosophical study along with, with the literature courses while I was there. Yeah, and you mentioned film as well. I must have been all that time spent in the video store. Uh, did you, um, were there any particular ways that you were able to tie that interest in English and philosophy into some of the um, film projects or film aspirations that you had? Yes. Um, my, my senior thesis, uh, which I, I, I like put quotes around the word thesis uh, for, for the English department was actually a, a, f a film, a student film uh, that, that I wrote and directed and made with a couple of my good friends who were also in, in film studies with me. And it, it's, it sounds so pretentious and, and arty to, d to explain it now, but um, it, was, it was basically uh, a narrative about... Um, what you see is not always what you get mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, interpersonal relationships and just one person's relationship with their world and, and how um, 
you know, there's, there are so many layers to what we're seeing at any one time. Like you may see someone and think you know who they are and where they're coming from and what they want and what they care about. And this, you know, again, this sounds so like ridiculously basic, but, um, it sounds like college. Yeah. Right. Like Like, thing you would do in college. Yeah. Like, and you react to that maybe, or you have assumptions about that, but more often than not, you're probably wrong, you know? And so anyway, it was about that. What did you uh, end up doing after graduation? So after graduation, um, I, I had been accepted to a graduate program um, and I, in, in film um, and copywriting, and I uh, moved to New Orleans, which uh, is a city where I've had family for years, and I've always romanticized it. I went there for um, New Year's uh, celebrations, I think every year during college and stayed with a friend who, who had a house in up to his family lived in uptown um, near um, Tulane and moved there with two friends in an in a apartment that didn't have air conditioning in the summer. Um, and I worked as a front desk clerk at a hotel which was super fun. There are all these jazz musicians that came through town and stayed in this little hotel in St. Charles and like I, they'd asked me, or, or, or I'd ask them if they wanted grapefruit juice or orange juice in the morning, and sometimes that would spark a conversation. Um, it was it was a good experience, and uh, I just assumed I was going to start that grad program in the fall. But being just in the world, out of the classroom, and being able to go to the independent film theater whenever I wanted to, to see a late night show, or you know have conversations with people, and and just the freedom to do whatever I wanted on the weekends without having any homework. And then I befriended a couple of people who were uh, jazz musicians or um, they were like hosts to the musicians that would come through town and just being exposed to their lifestyle. I was like, gosh, I don't know if I want to go back right back in the classroom. And, and I was getting not a great, um, I don't, I don't want to name the name of the program or the school, but, I visited it that summer and I did not have a good vibe either. It just didn't feel like the best fit because I had applied and gotten in without ever visiting before. It just seemed like a good program on paper. And so I deferred and I was like, I love writing. Why don't I try to get a job um, as a entry level reporter, editorial assistant somewhere? Because that's honestly what I like the most about quote unquote filmmaking, if you want to call that what I did with filmmaking, but I liked the writing part. I liked the dialogue. I liked the storytelling. And I had a few clips of, you know, little student articles I had done in the past. And so I put together these clips and mailed them to tons of magazines, newspapers, I mean, all over the country with, with a cover letter. It was just like, I'm just looking for anything. Uh, this is who I am. This is, this is, these are my degrees. I will come work for you. Um, you know, got mostly no replies. And uh, I got one reply from a magazine called Yes Magazine, yes, exclamation point, um, based right outside Seattle on an island in Puget Sound called Bainbridge Island. And it was a nonprofit magazine. And it, its, sub, its, its subtitle was uh, A Journal of Positive Futures. And it was a nonprofit that was started by a couple of ex Ford Foundation um, executives, I guess, one of whom was a was an economics professor at Harvard for years, I think, and they were trying to start, or they had started, a publication that only reports positive news, mm. and uh, it sounded like too good to be true, and like super hokey. But the more I looked into it, I realized that like they were actually doing really good journalism and really good, like in-depth reporting on um, environmental issues, like corporate watchdog issues, um, food and food system issues. And they weren't just finding a way to spin news uh, into a quote unquote good positive story. They were reporting on people that were trying to fix problems. Mm. So they would take, you know, a problem like, uh, you know, clear cutting in the Amazon. And instead of just have this uh, incredibly negative, depressing take on it, they would frame the story around, okay, here are, here are the people and the organizations actually trying to do something about it. And that would be the crux of their stories. 
and I love that. And so, um, I yeah, are they still around? They are. Oh, yeah. great. Okay, I'm gonna go subscribe tomorrow. <laughs> it's <laughs> it seems like something we could all use more of in our lives. I, I absolutely. I've I've thought that a lot um, in the in the past couple of years. Yeah, I think I've seen them on the newsstands in Whole Foods Market, and uh, the regulator used to have it, but I haven't been in the regulator much since the pandemic, so I'm not sure if they still do. But yeah, Yes Magazine. What's up, everyone? Popping in to say that if you haven't already, subscribe to the Buddy Ruski newsletter. Not only will you get alerted when new episodes drop, but you'll stay up to date on all things Buddy Ruski, including new content on the blog, upcoming projects, and more. Subscribe at BuddyRuski.com. Also, if you have feedback about the show or anything else you'd like to share, stories you're interested in, or people you think I should interview, my inbox is open and awaiting your message. Email me at justin at buddyrooski.com. All right, back to the amazing episode you've already been listening to. So you kind of find your way into the journalism world, um, but we still haven't reached making peanut butter yet. So what is the sort of take me through the like connecting thread? How do we get from being an entry level journalist to being interested in the idea of starting a peanut butter business? Yeah, we're getting we're getting closer. I promise. Uh, so the the co-publisher of Yes Magazine, uh, her name is uh, Fran Corton. Uh, she and her husband, David Corton, were the publishers. Um, they had been Peace Corps volunteers in, uh, I think, I know it was East Africa, I think Kenya in the in the 60s when, when the Peace Corps was, was brand new. And um, Peace Corps was something that I'd, I'd thought about for years. It's something I was interested in doing. Um, and, uh, I, th- it came up one day and when I, when I learned that Fran had been in, in the Peace Corps, um, she immediately said, oh, I think you would love it so much. You should apply. She said, um, my best friend who I was a volunteer with is the country director of Zimbabwe. And I said, oh, wow, that's amazing. That's so cool. That'd be a dream assignment. And, and she said, yes, but you can't, you know, you can't choose and, and, and I can't pull any strings. So you should just apply. And so I applied after, this is after I'd been at the magazine for about um, six months, I think. And it took a while, but um, I got in and they, ri- they assigned me to Estonia, which is in near the Arctic Circle, former Soviet Republic. Um, I have a circulation issue in cold weather where my hands get super numb, super fast, and then they hurt. Um, and it, it sucks. Even Durham winters are bad, but, you know, Estonia was like, no, I, I just couldn't do it. So I got a doctor's note. I got out of Estonia. And so they put me back in the, the lottery and Zimbabwe popped up and they said, you're assigned to Zimbabwe. And I, I just remember going to Fran. I'm like, you're never going to believe this, but I got assigned Zimbabwe. She was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to send, you know, Sally, who, her friend, the country director, an email, you know, that she needs to, to look for you because you have to go. She's like, you have to accept. She's like, we love you. We love, you know, you're doing a great job, but you really need to do this. So I was like, great. So I shipped off to Zimbabwe um, about six months later. So I'd been at the magazine about a year. And I was in um, a a rural community um, as a teacher uh, uh, of English as a second language um, down near the South African border um, in uh, Matabele land. And this is where the minority tribe lived. um, Very um, rural by even, you know, in any standards, no running water, no electricity. I lived in a a thatch roof, um, little... Uh, mud hut um, and it was fine it didn't rain much there it was very like scrubby almost desert but it had a rainy season and it had enough rain for people to grow crops and pretty much everyone there was a subsistence farmer and one of the crops they grew were peanuts a type of peanut um, they call ground nuts very closely related to the runner variety peanuts that grow well well here in the American Southeast and if you had asked me at pretty much any point in my life what my favorite foods were, uh, peanut butter was going to be top three. I, I love peanut butter so much and always have, and I really missed it when I was in the Peace Corps. That was definitely the longest I'd been without peanut butter. Um, and when I got there, um, I don't think there were any peanuts around for like six or seven months. And what most people did with the peanuts, would uh, they'd roast them over open fires, and then either just eat them whole 
um, as snacks, or they crush them with stones like a mortar and pestle and mix it into a stew to thicken it, add protein, um, and it was delicious. Uh, and I saw them crushing the peanuts with stones and thought that's just one step away or, you know, from peanut butter, just a little bit different ingredients. And so I got the same setup and uh, roasted peanuts over open fire, crushed them with stones, added a little honey that I had, a little sea salt and a little bit of like a thimble full of coconut oil. This is a couple pounds of peanuts we're talking about here just because it helped it all um, like emulsify and come, come together better. And not to toot my own horn, but it was so delicious. I mean, it was, you know, I had not had peanut butter in six or seven months. So that was definitely a factor in how good that tasted. But it tasted to me at the time way better than peanut butter that I remembered. And that it, cooking group at Davidson really paid <laughs> off in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, w it really was kind of an epiphany because I remember sitting there thinking, I've been buying peanut butter from billion dollar companies my whole life. And here I am with no electricity, no running water, just the simplest tools imaginable and just fresh ingredients and, and the willingness to sit there and do it. And I made a better version than I had ever had. Um, I don't have many regrets, but I do wish I had thought about I thought of starting a business around that back then mm. because that was the furthest thing from my mind. I was just so psyched that I created this delicious food and I didn't see myself as an entrepreneur, not even a future entrepreneur at the time. I just, you know, made, made some more peanut butter and, and when the peanuts were around, I did it again, but that was that. And when we were evacuated um, back to the States due to the, this was in 1999 and 2000, um, and when a lot of political violence erupted in Zimbabwe and got pretty ugly, we, um, we were evacuated. And uh, I had no job prospects coming back to the States. And I mean, my job at Yes Magazine was long gone. And, and um, but I, you know, I had much more of a writing portfolio now just from my year at Yes. And um, I was really interested in um, public policy related to nutrition and, and, and also writing. So um, I thought about moving to D.C. where I had a bunch of friends and I felt like that was, you know, maybe a good place to be for, um, for a while. And uh, got a job with the American Diabetes Association's national office uh, in Alexandria um, doing nutrition communications, basically translating um, clinical nutrition research into consumer-friendly articles. Did that for a few years, worked for a consulting firm, and then worked uh, as a um, communications manager for the uh, United Fresh Produce Association, which lobbies for more fresh produce in federally funded food programs. So like uh, food stamp, uh, fresh produce allowances, um, prison, uh, Department of Corrections, produce, and school food programs. And that was an awesome job and a great organization. Um, and then uh, I moved to Durham in 2000, at the end of 2005 to work for Counterculture Coffee uh, because... Uh, I didn't realize they were that old. Yeah, Counterculture started in 95. So they, wow. were, they were 10 years old when I joined them. But they they'd had a mostly wholesale focus okay. for the first I don't know eight nine years that they that they existed and um, I joined I think it was just lucky timing uh, on a couple of levels so I always went to this coffee shop in Arlington every day uh, where I lived uh, and one day they switched to counterculture and I had an espresso like I always did and it was way better and I was like wow like who are these guys? What are they doing differently? So I started reading about coffee more and, and I realized that they had this like incredible, um, almost cult like reputation among coffee shops and among people that knew coffee counterculture was very well known, but hardly any consumers knew about them because they didn't really have a consumer facing brand. And, um, long story short is I, I, you know, applied for a job and, and, and was hired to, uh, mainly do like website stuff, e-commerce, and then that turned more into marketing communications. And that's mainly what I was doing when I left seven years later. Um, but so starting there, that got me to Durham. And then in 2010, 
Um, I had just bought my first house, this little two bedroom, one bathroom house in, in Duke Park. And I was in the backyard sanding a piece of wood that was going in as trim. This is in October, in the fall. I got really hungry for my favorite snack, which is fresh slices of apples and peanut butter. Peanut butter again. And for some reason, right then, instead of thinking about the like grind your own Weaver Street Market or Trader Joe's peanut butter that I had in my pantry, I thought about what I made in Zimbabwe. And I thought about how good it was and how even though I, I'd been working in coffee and I had been involved in the local slow food movement as a, as a board member and just active volunteer basically. And I knew all these food entrepreneurs in the area who were very inspirational to me, but I didn't know anyone working with nut butters anywhere. And I went, I went inside and got on the computer and started Googling like, you know, small batch handcrafted peanut butter, almond butter, um, and I couldn't find anyone doing it anywhere in, in the U.S. I just found regional brands that were pretty established, like Justin's. And um, there's uh, Once Again up in New York State and Marinatha out west. There, there were a lot of kind of like natural food brands that were doing cool stuff, but nobody was really focused on that handmade small batch production. And, and I felt like, you know, at the very least, I needed to start making peanut butter for myself. And, and that was the first time that the idea of it as a business struck me. And so uh, I uh, had just met my now wife and business partner, Megan, and I couldn't wait to tell her the idea because um, we love cooking together and we talk about food all the time. You know, we plan, you know, if we, if we went anywhere for a weekend, it was all about, okay, where are we going to eat? What are we going to get? Where are we going to get coffee? And so... Um, I knew she would be into it. And as soon as I said, you know, I think I know a business that I want to start and it involves Peace Corps. And before I got another breath out, she goes, it's nut butter, isn't it? Because she had heard me tell that peanut butter story so many times. I was like, yep. And, And then before I could even tell her what I wanted to name it, she said, you have to call it Big Spoon. And I was like, yes, of course I'm going to call it Big Spoon because that's my dad's nickname because of the way he eats peanut butter right out of the jar with a big spoon. He's had that nickname since I was a little kid and I walked into the kitchen and he was doing that with like a serving spoon of Peter Pan. And right then we were just like, oh my God, like, yes, this is totally what I'm supposed to do. And uh, I went to Whole Foods in Durham and in October back then they right when you walked in they had these little burlap bags of North Carolina peanuts and North Carolina pecans that were raw and uh, I uh, bought a couple of each roasted them in a home oven and uh, with a food processor made a peanut pecan butter which just sounded amazing and I'd never seen that before uh, with honey and sea salt and then uh, and then I tried to recreate the recipe from Zimbabwe which was you know, fresh roasted peanuts, a little honey, sea salt, and a tiny bit of coconut oil. And they were both, you know, so good, honestly. Like, I, it's so fresh, and it's just the difference that, you know, freshness makes and the the flavor balance of that super fresh roast and the little bit of sweetness and a and, and tiny bit of acidity from the honey and then the pop of the sea salt. Um, those were the first the first jars I made. That is, uh, we we did the kind of speed round through, you know, coming back from the Peace Corps, sort of all the different uh, places that you worked before getting to to Big Spoon. I I love the name, by the way. I I always find uh, these like names that are attached to very sentimental things in someone's life to really pop when you're doing um, branding, just like it, it adds a layer of, um, of affection, but also like drive to really want to make it into something when it has this attachment to your personal life. I interviewed, uh, Anna Gabala who runs a moon belly meat company last show. And, uh, and the name moon belly also has a, um, sort of familial, uh, connection to, to her, her, um, Korean surname translated to moon. Um, and so that's um, where that uh, that connection comes from. And, and even for me, the name Buddy Ruski is connected to my 
uh, my dad and a nickname that he had given me when I was a kid. So, uh, yeah, that's a, a, a nice trend that I'm seeing in the uh, in the interviews that I'm doing. Uh, it's I also find there's like a um, speaking of threads, there is a a service uh, thread for you throughout your life. Your your father working in the Air Force, uh, you doing the the Peace Corps. Um, how does that idea of of service and kind of thinking about like creating thing creating something that will help people or you know will improve others lives how much of that is baked into what you're doing now with big spoon roasters yeah great great question um i thought about also serving in the military at one point um because uh so many of my role models did. Um, my my dad, obviously, his dad, um, my maternal grandfather, who um, lied about his age when he was 16 to um, go into the Navy during World War II. Um, thankfully, he came back. Um, we're all um, really amazing role models to me. And yeah, I, I mean, on a, on a simple level, I think service just feels good. It feels good to, to, to give to other people to try and to just to try and understand other people and their needs and, and try to meet, meet them where you can help. Um, and, you know, a lot of my career jobs before counterculture were for nonprofits. And I think that's definitely, um, th or there's definitely intention behind that because um, of I believed in the work they were doing. Um, and with Big Spoon Roasters, we from the beginning wanted to create a product that made the world a better place in in our mind. And and I fully accept that a lot of people may not think that you know a great tasting, sustainably made nut butter really makes the world a better place but we think it does because of so so many people have um a relationship with with nut butters they're they're a pantry staple um there's uh a, a, every time i i go and meet with a group of people um where i'm on a panel or or if i'm invited to like speak at a duke or unc class or something which is amazing that that even happens but first thing i do is ask people how many like how many how many of you have peanut butter or almond butter or some nut butter back in your dorm room or your house right now. And invariably, you know, nine out of 10 people. Um, so it, it's this, it's this pantry staple that we make that we try to elevate in terms of its, its flavor profile, its taste, its texture. Um, but also we try to create a version that celebrates and reflects the values that we have in terms of taking care of the planet and taking care of the people on it and taking care of the animals on it. And so by, by creating a product that's values based, um, we, we are trying to do positive service toward other people that share those values throughout the supply chain. Um, so that's one level where it's very intentional. Um, and then, inwardly focused at Big Spoon Roasters, we try to take care of the people who work there um, as, as just human beings and members of our community. And, and um, we felt from the beginning that, okay, we're starting a business from scratch. Like we're, all, a, a, everything this business becomes, like hopefully everything, you know, is, is gonna be by design. Um, there's some things we won't be able to control, but a lot of things we will be able to control, like how much we pay people and what benefits we offer. and um, the the ergonomics of the work that we do like all these things are choices that we can make and we've always tried to make every decision with the health and happiness of our of our team members in mind so um i think we th we, we think a lot about service toward the outside world but also service toward the people that work at big spoon roasters yeah it seems like durham a and having lived here my whole life i that is a recurring theme or sentiment, a lot of business owners that I've talked to. It. So it seems like Durham is a, a nice marriage there for the type of work that you want to do and, um, and the atmosphere that's been created here. Uh, is there something in your experience um, 
with all the work that you've done in nutrition, um, is there something about, I don't want to throw any like big brands under the bus, but like, you know, GIF, for instance, like, is there something specific about GIF versus the uh, nut butters that you are creating that you feel like really distinguish it from a, a health point of view? Like, is there one glaring yeah, thing that you're like, oh, yeah, people eating GIF, they're like putting this in their body that's really, you know, bad for them or whatever? Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, I definitely don't want to um, shame anyone who eats anything. Like, you know, your food choices are, are super personal and, and food, you know, we all have, we all have personal relationships with food. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I like to say that food is the most intimate relationship we have with matter. Um, you know, we have intimate relationship with other beings, but with matter, um, you know, uh, I think food is, is the most intimate one we have because whatever we eat, actually becomes us like our cells of our body are fed by what we put into it so um with with something like gifs like since you use that example um i don't know what gif tasted like i'll never know when it was first invented it may have been amazing it may have been you know incredible fresh perfectly balanced but at some point along the line of their growth and acquisition after acquisition and merger after merger, um, they have, um, and like many mass produced products, they've had to put, you know, homogen, you know, homogenization, uh, and, and scale and profit over things like taste and nutrition and sustainability. There are way less, uh, there, there are way less healthy foods anyone could eat than Jif. And again, I'm not shaming anyone that eats Jif, but compared to us, um, the biggest differences are um, a product like 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 Jif has hydrogenated vegetable oils in it as a stabilizer, um, and typically those are um, soybean, rapeseed, and cottonseed oils, which in and of themselves, um, you know, there are perfectly healthy uses for them, but they're um, hydrogenated, which means they're um, they're they're pumped and whipped for lack of a better term, uh, into uh, a solid Crisco-like texture at room temperature. And that is, is heated and blended into the peanut butter uh, in the factory and then cooled to make it stable at room temperature so that the natural oil separation that will occur in any peanut butter doesn't occur, so you don't have to stir it back in. It's purely convenience. Um, in small amounts, that's not going to hurt anybody. But if someone's eating a lot of those hydrogenated vegetable oils, um, it's 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 room temp and solid. Um, you know, when it's when it's outside your body, wh when when you eat it, um, you know, it probably melts and, it, and but it could stick to certain like certain places. You don't want it to stick, um, and it's essentially like eating spoonfuls of Crisco, um, which you know, I, I would not suggest anyone do that. But over time, that's basically what you're getting. Um, a, as a matter of fact, uh, when Jif and Crisco were both owned by Procter & Gamble, um, this is widely documented, uh, they were for a while, there was a plant that made both of them at the same time, and they had them on two product lines. And uh, at one point down the line, there was, there was a, a metal pipe that took Crisco and pumped it right into the Jif. Um, because it was the hydrogenated vegetable oil that they needed. And up through the 1970s, um, at different times, uh, I think Jif was, you know, like, uh, like a lot of it was, was uh, like 15% to 20% Crisco, according to a, a, there's a book called Creamy and Crunchy, The History of Peanut Butter, where all this is documented. It's fascinating. Are you documented in that book? No. Okay. No. Uh, and anyway... Uh, so we, we don't use any stabilizers. And again, like, there's nothing wrong with eating Jif. I don't want to, like, demonize it. Um, but what we do differently is we choose not to use those kinds of stabilizers, like hydrogenated vegetable oils, um, because we don't think they add any nutritional value. 
and they definitely don't add any taste value. In fact, they dilute taste, and that's that's another huge problem with with uh, mass produced nut butters like that. Is when you put something like a hydrogenated vegetable oil into the recipe, you're diluting that fresh roasted flavor, and so what you're getting is this blander version of of I think what it was originally intended to be, in my opinion. And there's also just less transparency around, you know, it, it might say sugar as an ingredient on, on that. Um, it, they used to use a lot more high fructose corn syrup, which most people who, you know, read a little bit of, of popular nu- nu- nutrition articles uh, realize that that's not great for you because of, of what it does in your body. Um, but if it just says sugar, it's just sugar. And you don't know where it came from. You don't know the labor situation behind that sugar. There are a lot of uh, problems with um, opaque supply chains and labor situations, especially in the developing world, especially in the tropical world. Um, and, you know, the, the people that produce things like sugar and um, uh, a lot of nuts like cashews in, in Vietnam and, and Southeast Asia, um, there are a lot of like unfair labor practices uh, that go on. And I'm not insinuating that any company has unfair labor practices, but they don't tell you one way or the other. And so with us, you know, we use an, an organic uh, honey that we'll, we know exactly where it came from, and we, we know the, the people that make it. Um, we use a, a sorghum syrup made from a uh, small batch uh, wood-fired sorghum mill, you know, in Tennessee. Um, we use uh, a, an organic coconut nectar that comes from a fair labor certified supply chain. Our cashews come from a fair labor certified supply chain. So we, we just try to take every single ingredient and get the best possible version of it in terms of quality and sustainability and transparency. And if, if we can't get something, even if we have a really fun recipe idea, but if we can't find the ingredient that meets our standards, we just don't, we don't mess with it. it. It took me a couple of years to find a ginger that we felt good about to make our Fiji gen- ginger almond butter. Because I was always uh, going to, whenever I'd go to like a natural food co-op or Whole Foods, I love to make my own trail mix out of the you know, bulk bins. And uh, I was always getting the crystallized ginger and mixing that in with almonds and cashews and peanuts and and then after starting Big Spoon a couple of years into the business, I was like, gosh, that'd be really good in a nut butter. I've never seen anybody put crystallized ginger in a nut butter. And then I started researching crystallized ginger and found that 95 or up percentage uh, uh, of tr- crystallized ginger in the U.S. came from China. And that in, in and of itself is not a problem. But c- I could find no information about the labor practices, the, the agricultural inputs. And anyway, long story short is I, I did a bunch of research and found um, the Fiji Ginger Project through this importer in California, and it, it, it's just what it sounds like. It's this project on the island of Fiji um, where they're doing sustainable agriculture around ginger, and they're actually gr- also growing the sugar cane there that they use to crystallize it. Um, it's, it's more expensive, but it's better quality, it's more transparent, and it's more sustainable, so that's all we use. I, I like that you uh, y- you said you know we're not insinuating that other people are doing this thing, but they're not being. It feels very your journalism roots. I feel like are coming out where you're like I'm not saying this on paper. I just want to be clear. But <laughs> you know, if you start digging a little bit, you may you may uncover some things. Um, what have been you s- you've talked about them a, a little bit um, as you're describing um, different supply chain challenges and things like that. But what have been some other challenges that you all have experienced as you're trying to scale? Because you, how many states is Big Spoon Roasters in now? Well, I mean, we, sh- we ship to all 50 states all the time with e-commerce, which is amazing. And then in terms of our um, wholesale customers, I would say we're in 45 or 46. Uh, That's almost all of them. I, th- I think <laughs> so, yeah. Is, uh, so so with, that, with that scale... You know, we've you, know, you mentioned uh, some of the things that you know folks will put in in other nut butters to um, maybe extend their shelf life or um, you know the types of preservatives that you know a lot of us are familiar with that help uh, 
keep foods longer, but may not necessarily be good for your body. How do you weigh that you know, scalability uh, with the ethical practices that you're the, or the values that you're trying to maintain in the business? Sure. We trying to think of the best way to put this. So there, when, when, when we started this business, there, there's no blueprint for a small batch nut butter business. Like you, you, you can't go to, um, any university that I know of and take the, you know, the two year certificate program in small batch nut butter making. Um, it's this po podcast. You, you've <laughs> got to get a, uh, job in journalism and then you go to the Peace Corps <laughs> and then 12 years later and you know some uh, crazy winding road map you'll find your way into uh, into grinding peanuts in your backyard and, and making small batches that's right that's right I I remember reading the Ben and Jerry's uh, autobiography I, I gosh I'm forgetting the name of it right now oh scooping scooping up a success something like that anyway um, for inspiration and they talk about taking the it's a f now famous Penn State University ice cream course right a lot and a lot of successful ice cream entrepreneurs have gone through that course and I remember reading that early in the book and I was like come on guys like <laughs> I'm, I, I gotta do completely self-taught stuff here um, I need to take that course but the point I'm getting at is um, we've developed our process of making nut butter through extremely simple equipment, extremely simple technologies. Um, and that's by necessity. Like this business has been bootstrapped from day one. I mean, our first grinder was um, a combination of one of those grinders that you see in a grocery store uh, that you grind your own peanut butter with and custom little custom milling plates that I had made to get the right texture. And so as we've grown, we've gotten a bigger mill. We've gotten um, like we started with one type of mixer and then we added another one and another one, same process. We just have three of them, um, for the first five, six years of the business, we filled every single jar by hand with a spoon. Um, like, like, like you're filling a can at home with just a tablespoon and a little canning funnel. At first it was just me doing that. And then it was me and another person and then three people and then four people and we rotated and then I taught myself how to do it with my left hand so I wouldn't get pain in my right shoulder and then you know eventually we got this um, piston driven um, it runs on compressed air jar filler where you pour mixed nut butter into a hopper and you step on a foot pedal and it fills one jar at a time and that's what we still use um, so we've just incrementally added tiny bits of automation to the process that are parts of the process that contribute no artisanship to the product. Like I, I tell our team all the time, you know, we're, con we're constantly trying to improve the ergonomics of what you do and, and cut down on um, the, the, the manual labor not associated with the artisanship of the process. So there's no artisanship in tightening the lid. There's no artisanship in applying the label. Those things are important. It's important for food safety. It's important that the jar look good on the shelf because, you know, somebody's not going to pay a premium for something if it looks sloppy. So all those things are important, but the, the things that are, you know, the most important are, are you know, um, getting the recipe right and being innovative and pushing the boundaries of what nut butters can be and and measuring things by hand and making sure that that's done well and tasting and developing your palate and tasting every batch when it comes off the mixer and understanding okay this lot of this lot of salt is a little different than the last one does that mean we need to make an adjustment um so as we've grown and continue to grow um, we've just added little bits of automation uh, and like the side labels that go on our jars um, those used to all be done one by one on this tiny little tabletop semi-manual la roller labeler. Um, and now we have a slightly bigger thing that applies the label to it that you don't have to touch as it's coming through it. So we're still so tiny, even though I know it seems like 
our jars might be everywhere in Durham, but if you looked at a pie chart of the nut butter business in the United States, which is like a, I don't know, $3 billion, like we don't even show up on that. Like literally we're not even a microscopic threat on that. Um, I'm very proud of our growth and, and where we are, but we have so much further to grow before um, our process would need to change at all is the point I'm getting at. And, and if ever there's a decision point where um, adding something to our process or changing it could possibly compromise quality, then we won't do it. And that's, um, that's something we really firmly believe in. Yeah. And that's, I, I think sometimes I am quick to judge businesses for taking certain measures in an effort to scale because I, I think of, you know, on the surface, I'm like, oh, it's a, it's a money grab. You do something to scale because you can make more money and it's, um, you know, you throw your values out the window and, you know, it's all about the bottom line. Um, but then you think about like, well, there are actual people attached to these businesses. They have employees who have, you know, families and lives. And uh, and so you want them to succeed. And, and sometimes taking that, you know, one not shortcut, but like sort of going a, in a slightly different direction that may alter your process a little bit, you know, can actually do more good in the aggregate. And so, you know, I, having you know, worked in, uh, in entrepreneurship uh, a little bit, you know, we weren't as tied to um, supply chains and things like that. But, um, you know, having that understanding of these are all complicated decisions for an entrepreneur to, entrepreneur to make um, is something that I'm reminded of, um, especially talking to local small business owners um, and how, yeah, just complicated it is, especially when you are a very value-driven company. Um, the, I, I, don't, I don't get the sense that the world really like, allows those types of companies to thrive, unfortunately. Um, it just doesn't seem to be set up that way, but it is, um, you know, that's why I think like shop local movements, you know, sort of returning to um, locally sourced uh, ingredients, uh, local companies, um, you know, that are starting uh, businesses and uh, all that kind of stuff. I, I think is, yeah, important for us to uh, remember when we're like, oh, you know, this, this nut butter costs, you know, a dollar fifty more than the one I can get at Harris Teeter, but you know that you know, that's the value. You know, that's the the difference in values. I think that extra dollar fifty, and so um, yeah, I, I uh, have been thinking a lot about that more in my own personal life, and and hope that other folks are also considering that as they're um, making decisions. And, and to your earlier point, you know, it's not just about uh, price, but it's also uh, you know it's what you're putting in your body and that kind of stuff adds up. You know, you, you talked about your father's, um, you know, health concerns with diabetes and how much that affected you uh, growing up. You know, these things are not in a vacuum. You know, what we eat, uh, even if we are taking, you know, paying less for the food now, we end up paying more for, you know, our health down the road. And so um, hopefully, you know, we can get to a point where, you know, the value-based companies are the cheaper ones. And, um, you know, we are not so, um, you know, concerned about the food in our school. I mean, I was thinking about that uh, yesterday about just like, you know, why so many students struggle in schools. It's because the, the cafeteria food is not, um, you know, doing them any service in terms of providing the nutrition they need to, to learn. So, I, you know, going off a, a bit on a, my soapbox there, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool to hear that you all are really thinking about that and not rushing to scale and able to keep those values at the, at the core of your business. Um, we're, we're, we've got, uh, we, we kind of blew through it. I, I thought that I was going to be able to, uh, to, to break us a couple of times, but uh, you really covered a lot and it was fun to see how this, uh, story wove together, uh, knowing, you know, where we started and kind of how we got to, um, the founding of, of Big Spoon Roasters. What, uh, what are you all up to now? You've got more than just the, um, the jars of nut butters. I've mm -hmm. seen the, 
um, I won't call them granola bars. I'm sure you have like an actual term for them, but it essentially, um, well, yeah. How, how would you describe the the products that you are offering now? W well, we, we you can just call them bars. Okay. Uh, or I mean, energy bars. What the, we call them nut butter bars. As far as I know, we coined the term nut butter bar uh, way back when we started the business. Um, so yeah, real quick, my, my wife and business partner, Megan, um, she was making incredible homemade inter peanut butter based energy bars like for years before we even met. So when I started making nut butter as Big Spoon, um, she started using that nut butter in the energy bars and they like we thought they were so good, they were even better. Um, and so we, we've been selling the bars since the earliest days. It just took us um, longer to figure out how to, how to make those um, and package them at, at any scale at all that made sense as a business. Um, and, and nut butters was easy to figure out just, okay, a spoon into the jar. Um, the bars, we've had so many different iterations of figuring out how to make and package them. But yes, we, we do make, um, those are our two product lines, um, nut butters and, and nut butter bars. And we have a a program that I'm proud of called the Feature Jam Program uh, or series, Feature Jam series. Every month we work with a different jam maker, um, a small batch a jam maker that uh, similarly values based. And um, we feature their jam on our website and do um, PB and J pairings and A, B and J almond butter and jam pairings. And you can subscribe or like give a subscription. Um, so you're surprised every month with a different PB and J pairing. Um, and uh, we have a limited batch series of nut butters where every quarter, so on the quarter, so January, February, March is one, April, May, June, et cetera, uh, we offer um, a limited batch of nut butter that is really pushing the boundary of what a nut butter can be. So it's, it's, it's always a concept that we've never seen before. Um, like right now, it's fig, walnut, macaroon, almond butter. So diced uh, dried figs, um, shredded toasted coconut um, in an almond butter base with coconut nectar and sea salt. Um, and we've, uh, we've done now almost two years of limited batches and they're always, uh, they're always a lot of fun to make on the R&D side and, and customers uh, get excited about them. And they're mostly just available on our website and in um, uh, a few select retailers around the country. Is there a particular recipe that you haven't done yet that you're really excited to explore? I have a long list, a long list that I'm always working I should on. Have known. Yeah, I'm 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 always in in R and D mode, thinking about we're 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 doing a a couple of cool collaborations that I can't talk about publicly yet. Um, that'll come out this fall, hopefully. Um, that I'm working on right now. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, um, we're also moving to a bigger space. That's the big news in our world. Um, we have been in the same uh, flex space that we've, we've leased in Durham since 2013, and we've been able to grow a couple times within that building um, and have an amazing landlord who's worked with us a lot. And then, w then we, we rented another outside storage bay and then a second one, to and we've just grown outgrown our space. And after a lot of looking, we found one about six months. We found a, the perfect building that hopefully will be our forever home um, that we're renovating. Um, that's about six miles away from our current space. And if all goes well, we'll move in um, early August. And, and uh, it's so far so good. We just got the permits in last week, and they're doing construction in earnest. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank uh, you. This has been a wonderful conversation. Um, I have a jar uh, of Big Spoon Roaster sitting in my cabinet. I am definitely somebody who has historically kept peanut butter uh, in, in the pantry uh, as a staple. Um, and so I'm excited to keep Big Spoon as my uh, staple nut butter. I shouldn't just say peanut butter, but nut butter uh, in my rotation. Um, where can people uh, find Big Spoon Roasters uh, locally here in, in Durham or in the Triangle? We have several um, great long-term wholesale customers in Durham, um, Whole Foods Market, um, Foster's Market, Google Hub, um, Boldega, Coco Cinnamon, um, uh, Joe Van Gogh has, uh, they have this amazing toast dish where you can get our um, Fiji ginger almond butter uh, on, on toast, I think at their Woodcroft location. 
Cool. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to, to make the trip. I think I got, I want to say I got mine from the Durham Co-op maybe. Yeah, uh, Dur- Durham Co-op, uh, part and parcel downtown as well. Loaf Bakery. Yeah. So there's there's plenty of opportunities to, to get your own uh, jar of Big Spoon Roasters. Uh, online, can people find you at, at BigSpoonRoasters.com? Is it that easy? It's that easy. And, and all the socials as well at Big Spoon Roasters. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks again, Mark, for, for being on the show. This has been a, a, a delightful conversation, and I look forward to, to hearing more about the collaborations you have going on later in the fall and just how the, the new building's going and sort of where Big Spoon goes from here. Enjoy your, your weekend, and uh, we'll talk to you all very soon.